I believe we are live. We're being told by our engineering staff, our vast engineering staff, that we are live. Welcome to GI Joe Debrief. My name is Brandon Jerwa. I'm joined by Robert Atkins and Tom Feaster. And we've all worked on GI Joe over the years in various capacities. Tom and Robert are brilliantly gifted artists and I occasionally jot some words down on paper. So we don't know if you're watching this, but we hope you are. We'd like to say in advance that we're doing this for fun. Our views do not represent anybody we work for or anybody associated with GI Joe other than us. So we're just here to recollect and have a little good time during a very not good time otherwise. <laughs> and uh, gentlemen, if you would please talk about yourselves. Take it, Robert. Uh, okay, so uh, quick introduction. Uh, I'm Robert Atkins. Uh, I'm currently the artist on G.I. Joe, Real American Hero, the comic book written by Larry Hama. Um, so that's coming out through IDW Publishing. Uh, mostly with G.I. Joe, uh, in, in my background has been through the comic books uh, with IDW. I did some work earlier with Devil's Due, but uh, it's been awesome. Growing up on the property, getting a chance to work on it professionally, it's just been a total dream, so it's pretty awesome. Uh, my name is Tom Feaster. Uh, I started my obsession with G.I. Joe when I was uh, gifted with nearly everything from the original line on Christmas morning of 1982. Um, I started working on G.I. Joe uh, Origins about 16 years ago, 15 well, years ago, somewhere in that 2009, area. 2009, right? 2008. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it was a dream come true, like Robert said. Um, you know, you, you get to work on these things that you grow up loving, and it's just surreal that your name is associated with something that you love so much. Um, since G.I. Joe, uh, I've done a lot of cover work, uh, primarily Marvel and DC. Um, and the last few years, I've worked in animation and done a lot of licensing art for companies like Adult Swim and Cartoon Network. Currently, I'm a character designer on an upcoming animated series that I'm not allowed to talk about yet. Uh, safe to say, though, that I'm really excited about it, and it's going to be a lot of fun. We all live in a world where we do things we can't talk about. Uh, so <laughs> I was a writer on G.I. Joe uh, for Devil's Do. Uh, I started off on G.I. Joe Frontline. And then uh, I was given the golden gift of being able to write the main title for a, a good long while. Uh, I also did Master and Apprentice 1 and Master and Apprentice 2, two different miniseries about the ninja factions uh, in the Joe universe. And I got to work with Robert on Snake Eyes Declassified, which was uh, really, really special because uh, people seemed to like it. And it was wonderful because I got to work with a very talented artist. That's you, Robert. Uh, and uh, I got to uh, I, I got to play with a story that was originally crafted by the guy who put us all here, Larry Hama. So that was very important to me. Uh, in the intervening years, I've I've gone on to do a whole bunch of other licensed comics. It, it literally launched my career in comics. Uh, and the past few years, I've been working in games, uh, being a story editor for NBC Universal and working on Glue on the Britney Spears game of all things. Uh, <laughs> and now I am a story editor and writer at Funko. So I'm actually working for a toy company now, a lifelong dream come true. <laughs> and to be able to sit here with you guys and, and enjoy this toy, comic book, cartoon, movie, bubblegum franchise that we've all been so affected by is, is really great. And uh, I believe Tom deserves the credit for getting us together. And if it's a complete failure, it is all on his shoulders. Yep, that's absolutely true. It's absolutely <laughs> true. Uh, yeah, the intent was just uh, there's so much bad going on right now, and it's so crushingly uh, depressing and overwhelming. And I thought, uh, here's something fun that we could do to take ourselves back to a happier time and uh, hopefully spread some of that good time with other people. So please be uh, nice. If yeah, you have something yeah, shitty to say... Uh, kind of it, what spurned it on was that Hasbro kind of put these up on YouTube right for everybody to watch so it was kind of yeah. yes you really kicked it off yeah thank you to Hasbro uh, for doing that yeah uh and uh like Tom said you know this is a, a labor of love and just for fun so if, you know we've got commenters and stuff if you got an axe to grind go grind it somewhere else we're just trying to have a good time here <laughs> uh, and there may be kids watching we hope there's kids watching because G.I. Joe is I don't I don't mean to break it to you but for kids first what? and foremost I know. 
overgrown kids. Uh, I should note before we get started that we would not be here without the help of our Fobbit. Fobbit, introduce yourself. <laughs> So, uh, so for those of you that don't know, Fobbit is a term that came out of Iraq, and it basically means the guy that hides out at the forward operating base and doesn't go into action. So uh, I'm just here to keep the technology running. Uh, I'm Carson from 3D Joe's. I've been a G.I. Joe fan since 1985 when I first saw the cartoon on TV. Uh, I run a website called 3djoes.com that I've been running since uh, 2012, so eight years now. Um, one of my favorite compliments was when Robert Atkins, uh, unprompted shout out, uh, basically said that he would go to 3D Joe so that he could look at the characters in 360 rotation so he could see how the uniforms are resolved. That yeah, made me, it helped a lot. Yeah. Made me feel good. I still, I still use it. Yep. So uh, <laughs> anyway, I've also done uh, art books. So every piece of painted artwork I've gathered in the six uh, soft covers, and we're working on a hard cover now that gathers all that together because we sold out of the soft covers. So G.I. Joe's lifelong passion. My dad was Lieutenant Falcon. He was a Special Forces operator back in the 80s when Falcon came out. So I think that's one of the things that bonded nice. to like for life. He was actually fifth group. Like if you look at the, if you look at the file card, Larry wrote, he was channeling my dad. My dad went to language school. My dad was the executive officer. My dad was fifth group. Oh, that's cool. It's all Falcon. So anyway, um, <laughs> that's, I think that's one of the reasons that I can explain this psychosis. So anyway, uh, thank you guys for having me. It's an honor to be with people that I have, you know, garbled, gobbled up your work, man. You guys are amazing. You breathe life into the brand. Uh, that includes you, Tom. I've got your art hanging on my wall, so don't ever feel second, buddy. <laughs> don't you ever feel second. Anyway, listen, uh, we, appreciate we you all guys. live in Robert's shadow. <laughs> I, appreciate I just want to say that if I disappear from this, uh, we are currently experiencing in Seattle a massive thunderous hailstorm that just started out of nowhere. Wow. So if I vanish, please, please go on without me, just like I know you always wanted to. Uh, the comments, Brandon, you'll be relieved to know that uh they're all they're all positive so far man what's up guys uh i love that snake woo, has declassified woohoo woo party thanks be to hasbro 3d joe and, and uh dial tone carson is my nickname now go ahead yes and, and Brand, brandon we will uh never leave a man behind there you go i appreciate that i do appreciate that so we're going to get into uh chapter one of the mass device the very first animated feature seen for gi joe it was a five-part miniseries and it became the tradition for a while there before it kicked off the main animated series i love these stories i love these five-part stories uh, i have stolen the concept of needing to get pieces of things to put together a thing or stop a thing so many times i have ripped this off so many times I'm not even ashamed of it. It's classic storytelling uh, and a great way to play with your action figures. Before we kick this off, does anybody know what mass stands for in mass device? Oh, is this for us? <laughs> I don't well, think anybody I, in the audience is gonna answer, Robert. <laughs> I, 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 was, I didn't know there was gonna be studying involved. I know there's a quiz. Wait, yeah, I, 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 um, I purposely came to this and a great many things knowing absolutely nothing, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Molecular <laughs> assembler, scrambler, sender. Wow, oh, you did your homework. Right. <laughs> well, here's the like curious it. thing is I'm very, I'm very curious because I haven't watched this in a long time. I'm not sure they ever say that. Oh, so really? I don't know if this has been derived oh. from some other source or somebody decided what it, it sounded like, or maybe my memory is going because I'm old. You went to totally Wikipedia. <laughs> you went to Wikipedia. No, no, never go to Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did um, come out with a, a toy in 2008, right? You could get yeah, the different yes. parts if you bought ah. the DVD, like that. I wonder yeah, if it, it was maybe like on a file card there, or if that hadn't been defined before, be. before. I'm sure they did it there. Shameless plug, if anyone's got a complete mass device set, Carson from 3D Joe's is looking to buy, so hit me up. <laughs> um, Brandon Jerwa might have one, Carson. Word? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have to check the basement, but I may have one. Not even playing. I would gladly purchase okay. it at fair market value. Um, okay, so <laughs> I will, uh, Jerwa, will happily mark it up for you. There's a comment. Are you drinking <laughs> a martini <laughs> right now? I drink some martini. <laughs> I am drinking a martini. That is amazing. Okay, so Jerwa, there's a question for you, or maybe not a question, but it, it piqued my curiosity. It, this comment from Brandon says, Jerwa and I both got our first Joes in Manhattan, Kansas. What's the story there? Uh, oh, I did. Uh, oh, wow, wow, okay. Uh, I got my very first G.I. Joe figure, Flash, mm -hmm. uh, at the Kmart in uh, Manhattan, Kansas. Mm -hmm. uh, I would later get G.I. Joe number one, the giant comic book. Uh, the art of the giant comic book is lost. We need to bring it back. Yep. Uh, I got that at Alco in Junction City, Kansas, which is just down the road. 
uh, which is also where I got the Polar Battle Bear. Everything else, I can't remember where I got it, but I definitely remember Flash. Uh, and that was a that was a transformative experience. Incidentally, I almost I almost also bought my first record at that Kmart, and it was the game by Queen. But that has nothing to do with GI Joe. It just dates me as an old person. So so interestingly, my dad was stationed in uh, Fort Riley, and I was born in Manhattan. Yes, Kansas. I was born in Manhattan, Kansas. That's why I had to ask it. I'm like, what the hell? That's crazy. You Quite were? I was born in Manhattan, you, Kansas. Wait, you wait, you were? Yes, sir. 1979. Oh you my know? God. Yep. My stepmom worked on Fort Riley as an operator. Yep. Uh, my dad was a car dealer. He sold uh, cars to GIs every day, literally every day. There you go. Uh, that's amazing, man. Wow. Yep. It's, okay. That's why I had to read Small the question. World. I'm like, I got to get down to the to the bottom of this. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. Oh, well, so great. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna try the screen share real quick. Give me a second. Launch desktop two. Share computer sound. Fobbit is boop boop beep boom. <laughs> All right, and then I'm going to go full screen, and hopefully this will work. Nope, nope, nope. Hang on. Fobbit's messing up. Wait for it. Get the right screen. There we go. You guys good on volume? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So I got to say, just because it was the first frame of the, the scene, like the Sky Striker was always my absolute favorite vehicle. I think it was probably just growing up in the 80s with the M14. It was all yeah. Oh, it was great. I actually, I had the uh, the glider and never get the damn thing to work. I mean, it's just every time straight into the ground. Yep. I never had a glider. My Sky Striker, that was weird. <laughs> I wonder if those gliders. So at what point are we gonna? At what point are we gonna talk about Snake Eyes' lack of gloves? Because it still bothers me. It's so weird. Yeah. His hands are weapons. <laughs> They'd be concealed otherwise. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They'd be concealed weapons. But those are holsters if you put gloves on them. You don't keep a weapon like that in the holster. Okay. No way. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the intro because this changed over the years. Mm -hmm. yeah, and here yeah, it is, yeah. it's G.I. Joe against Cobra and Destro, and they would later set that apart, you know, Destro really kind of went off on his own thing, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was it was established very early on, and I love that. Je Destro is my favorite Cobra villain, even though I oh, consider him his own man, uh, and yeah. he is, uh, for me, like, he's more, he's almost like a, a hyped up James Bond villain. Oh, yeah. definitely. Like, I always thought, just from watching the cartoons, that he was black. Like he was a black guy. And then when I had to draw him as like this white Scottish dude with blonde hair, I was like, what? Like, it, it was like, it threw me for a loop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people thought that because of the, the voice actor's voice. And I don't think people understood he was supposed to be Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a much different show if they had kind of really laid on the, the heavy Scottish accent for Destro. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go full Connery. Oh, that would have been, it would have been, yeah, exactly. Going full Connery is a little scary, though. <laughs> yes, my dear commander. <laughs> so, have you guys met the voice actor for Destro? Uh, I haven't. Yes. It's, Has it's the show yes, frozen for everybody else? I paused it. You want to keep rolling? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah keep rolling. rolling. Keep rolling. Okay. Yeah, it's incredible to meet these people in person. Totally. So we're, we're coming up on my first big problem. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Why'd well, Snake Eyes duck? Oh, he was faster to respond than everybody else. Yeah. Uh, why is Snake Eyes not giving them any kind of warning, like pulling them down? Like, hey, guys, we might yeah. just about die here in a second. <laughs> he really did. Right it. It's every man for themselves. Yeah. Exactly. You can't talk, you insensitive monster. Well, you, you, you pull them down. Yeah. Every man for himself. Yeah. And so this is my next big problem. Because uh, I had been reading the comic book for some time before this. And so th the blasphemy that Duke and Scarlet were in a relationship uh, yeah. and not Snake Eyes. Mm -hmm. Now somewhere Diana Davis is having a heart attack and swearing <laughs> and throwing things. Sure. My, but, problem, uh, my problem with this first episode is that we never got a Cobra jet like that. Uh, Amen. That jet is beautiful. No. Is that based on a MiG? I think it is. Yep. Yeah. It's a good looking jet. And all you had for Cobra, you eventually got the Rattler, but you had the tiny fang first, you know? Right. Yes. Yeah. They do a really nice job of featuring all the toys. Mm -hmm. Now, another oh, thing I, I, in hindsight, 
I wish they had made a set of just rank and file soldiers mm, with Joe true. and with Cobra. Like, it, it blows my mind that they never made like a three figure set of just, you know, Cobra soldiers and just rank and file Joes. Yeah. Group building was not a concept then. And and what's great about that is, is one year uh, for Christmas, because we had a bunch of relatives uh, who all decided to send presents who normally didn't. I got an extra stormtrooper and an extra Cobra soldier, and I thought I was the coolest guy alive. It never <laughs> occurred to me to have more than one. Right. See, I, I was the the child of divorce, so I was lucky because I would get stuff from like my dad, and then more often it was my mom. Uh, so there was little communication. So sometimes <laughs> I would double up on cool stuff. So were you able to trade that off then? No, I, I wasn't smart enough to try to play anyone against each other. <laughs> so I got in in 1985, and unfortunately, there was no chance of me finding a Sky Striker. So seeing this cartoon and seeing the Sky Striker featured so prominently almost every episode just, like, broke me. There was no way I could get it. Yeah, I did. I, I had a Sky Striker. I, I, I picked up a Sky Striker at Joe Lanza here, uh, like, two, three years ago. And uh, it was all I could do to not run through the, the convention, just going, <laughs> you know, because uh, it felt real good to have one in my hands again. Uh, oh, man. That's what I, she said. Uh, recently, recently, I uh, I don't know. I, I, was, I didn't have it as a kid either, even though it was my absolute favorite. And I had, like, a really cheap knockoff kind of F-14 that I had always, like, throw Joe's in. It was a little bit too big for them, but I, I loved it anyway. No! Uh, as I got back into collecting the toys, um, yeah, I've been picking up Sky. It, it became a bit of an obsession. I think I've got like uh, 10 or 11 of them. I have way too many. Wow. Whoa. But it's wow. like, uh, I, cause I got, I got the flag. I had it set outside my studio. I'd line them all up on there and occasionally I would just take a break and then grab it and fly it around a bit. Oh my gosh. That's was difficult. <laughs> just run. I wish they, there he is. Yeah. Climbing to this ridiculously melodramatic location. So uh, Diana Davis raised a good point. The reason that they changed Snake Eyes' hands to white was so that you could see him in action. Like, look at my hands against oh! my jacket. So he's not, yeah. not just a blob. Well, he doesn't yeah, really by the way, to anybody anything. watching, yeah, to anybody watching, we're not we're not experts about the show, so. <laughs> we're guessing. Yeah, there's there's going to be little to no trivia about the show itself. Yeah. We, we, we spin it all on the definition of the mass device. That was it. You're not going to yeah, learn yeah, a lot. Yeah, totally. But hopefully you'll be entertained. Yeah, yeah, cross your fingers. Uh, so now, I, I did, wanted to say too. Any, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, did did any of you guys ever try to build a mass device out of Lego? That, that's what I did. Oh, I did. I, yeah. I did it out of a robotics set. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, so uh, interesting note. Uh, I always was bothered by the notion that Duke was the leader in the cartoons and not Hawk. Uh, because because Hawk's my yes. dude. Yes, uh, you're, you're right. He should have been the leader. He should have, absolutely. But but here is an interesting thing about this time period. This is second wave G.I. Joe on the shelves, right? We're, so that's why we see characters like Tripwire and CoverGirl. Right. At this point, Duke and Major Blood were mail-away figures. Oh, let me get into that. So <laughs> Tom's got a flag point axe to grind. <laughs> oh, yes. So I just remember, now again, I'm a kid. I think I was in third grade, um, maybe fourth. And uh, the, the weight for Duke was, uh, it was awful. Every day going to the mailbox and just walking away with disappointment because it felt like he was never going to arrive. Yeah. Uh, and then it was worse to have to watch this show. And Duke is so cool. And he's such a big part of it. And nobody had a friggin' Duke figure. Nope. Nope. So shout out to uh, shout out to Form BX. I don't know if you guys watch him on YouTube, but he got his name from that lady saying that she needed Form BX whatever in, tri in triplicate. So people go deep on this franchise, man. They'll take one little thing like that, and that'll be his whole like online persona. I love it. Um, so yeah, Duke was the first sergeant, right? He was the non-commissioned officer. He had climbed the length yeah. to be enlisted, but you know he wasn't officer. He wasn't going to come in second lieutenant. He he worked his way up. And so it makes sense that people would respect him and follow him into battle, but not that he would like command the whole battalion. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, when, when, when Hawk doing... finally got his moment to shine, I was very happy. Yeah. When I was doing covers, I, I tried really hard to get through a version of Snake Eyes colored like the show, uh, but it got shot down. <laughs> I, I was always trying to sneak in Easter eggs from, you know, whatever the show was. Incidentally, I did a cover with Zartan that was made up of a bunch of little faces. Yep. Um, and so I actually got photos of my childhood friends that I watched this with. Nice. So uh, Jez and Zach are in there. Uh, I, I contacted them through Facebook, and they were both nice enough to, to let me use photos of them as part of that Zartan montage. That's awesome. Oh, that's that's really great. I, I put a lot of my friends in GI Joe as well, so that's great. Um, the sound also, just went dead. On, on the quick time? Uh, no, I can hear it. I'm I can good. hear it just fine. Um, one one thing, real quick, about the show. I always thought it was weird. Why, like Snake Eyes goes through this huge like uh, cloak and dagger to get into the base. Yeah. And then <laughs> Scarlet kind of just skyrockets in. And then Stalker just blows the place up. Like he's the distraction, they land, man. I know, they all, but they all land on the same roof and then just well, walk in God. together. <laughs> like, what was the point of? Uh, <laughs> I guess to show three different ways that they could infiltrate. I suppose. Ah, uh, there you go. We were right. around. around. There you go. Um. So here's a little trivia. Larry Hama saw Houston's design for. Uh, the the castle snake castle that we just saw and that's that's when Larry decided to use that design in uh, the silent issue number 21 oh, very cool good little very, trivia. Very nice. so that came from the cartoon there you go even though Larry has never watched the cartoon the cartoon still made it into the comic just what does it do this is the ultimate relay star it can receive and send the most uh, not it's the ultimate relay star guys not to be confused with all those other inferior relay stars <laughs> those knockoff relay stars precisely <laughs> now let's tour the silo and i remember when i was first started to draw gi joe and i drew the first uh, beret i drew because i've never been in the military but the first beret i drew just looked like a sack of potatoes on flint's head and i got called out for it like big time uh, and, but then it's so funny because I look at it at the you know Stalker's beret here. And it's like it just looks like some floppy doppy like nothing. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. People take that stuff personally, man. It's crazy. I I yeah. cosplayed as Lieutenant Falcon, and uh, yeah, I got comments from the photos of my beret not looking properly groomed. I know, man. Oh, uh, and, but, the, but I was great. I was so glad I got called out on it because then I looked it up and I made sure exactly it. I knew what the dimensions were and how you know how high it should be and all this kind of stuff. And I yep. learned from it, you know. So it was good to hear from. Him, yep. That, that cover I drew of. Can we turn the sound down on the uh, show a little bit? Yeah, let me know if you guys can still hear it. Okay. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Destro's <laughs> metal face has such movement. Oh, I know. I know when I, first, yeah, when I first started drawing it for IDW, they said, like, never show his face express. And I was like, oh, man, that's actually really difficult. I liked it better when he, you know, because I just, again, I grew up on the cartoon. I was used to yeah. him having this very malleable metal face, which makes no sense. But. It's not possible. He's also got eyebrows. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> metal eyebrows. <laughs> just, so that is not even the most preposterous thing. <laughs> They're like, what? I don't believe it anymore. Now, this this really this brings me a lot of joy. I mean, like I I can't tell you how many times uh, I would watch a rerun of GI Joe. Like a rerun of GI Joe was better than a new episode of most cartoons for me. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, now, I feel like I have door. to. I feel like I have to mention something about Baroness because Robert, I don't know if your experience is the same as mine, but like. When you sign up to work on G.I. Joe, what they don't tell you is that for the next several years of your life, everyone who's ever had some sort of sexual fantasy about the Baroness uh, feels the need to tell you about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, oh, it's no different when you're writing it, my friend. <laughs> okay. <the> time. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, She's a very attractive woman. I, I've so, been told you know, repeatedly. Let, let's talk with Major Blood. What's the deal with his arm? Is it a robot hand or is it just some sort of the funky glove? I've got a lot of. There, 
I've got a lot it, of insight it, into that, Tom. I actually spoke okay. with John Rudat, the figure designer, about it. And the thing is, with these creators that made this stuff three decades ago, these memories are 30 years old plus now, coming up on 40. And so yeah. in, in the interview that I did with Ron, I believe back in 2014, he said, no question, it was a cybernetic arm. The arm was gotcha. gone. It was a robo arm. Um, okay. But, you know, there's lots of other people out there that believe that it is blast armor for that rocket gun that he had because he had the backpack with a few rockets in it. And yeah. They had the gun yes, that shot yes. the rockets. And so a lot of people think it's blast armor. So you could take it either way. But Ron Rudat designed it, and he said it's a, a basically a cybernetic add-on arm. So I'm going with that. If anybody would know. Yeah. Well, and what I loved so much about G.I. Joe was that, uh, and the property in general, I mean, part of its huge success was that everybody was so individual. It's also yeah. what makes it an utter pain to draw, but <laughs> like, <laughs> but as a, I, you can, every single character has this huge backstory and has uh, all of these design details that they don't really address. So it's up to you yeah. just to you're just thrown in completely immersed. Like we don't need a backstory of uh, major blood's arm. He just looks cool. Oh yeah. man. But it would have been awesome for like maybe the hearts and mind series where you just have a one-off about a different character. Like they did major blood and they showed him having a family life at home, which really fleshed him out for me. He was just a mercenary. I really, like, I, that's what I kind of hoped like origins would be. Yeah. yeah. Same here. That's, that's what I thought Arrow origins was going to be. I, I thought we were going to get a glimpse of, you know, the backstory of some of these people. Um, I, I, think they, I think that was the idea, and I think they're trying to figure it out as they went. Like, eventually, they kind of landed on a few really good arcs, but it was kind of all over the place sometimes because they weren't yeah. really sure what they were doing with it. But. Did you guys read Hearts and Minds, Max yeah. Brooks? Yes. Yeah. I, I loved it. I mean, each character was more multidimensional at the end of each issue. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, I think so, yeah, for sure. Yeah, all of this okay. stuff, all, all of this, like, uh, other tech, built it all in Lego. You know, like it was oh, so whatever awesome. Lego I had around, um, you know, what, whatever I didn't have uh, a toy for, I would try to figure out how to build it. Yeah, me too, except it was, I was not a Lego kid. I was a robotics kid. Um, so it was the same for me. But yeah, I, I definitely tried to, to replicate a lot of this stuff. I was incredibly fortunate because I was the second youngest grandchild of 13 uh, kids. So I had uh, hand-me-down Legos, uh, like an absurd amount of hand-me-down Lego. And uh, so I was really lucky because I, I could build giant stuff. Um, you know, I, I, we weren't rich. I, I was just right place, right time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think um, about the level of sci-fi, you know, in the in this story? Because there was times where we were working on the book and... He would say, oh, that's too sci-fi of a concept for G.I. Joe. And I'm like, have you guys seen the miniseries? Like, this yeah, whole yeah. thing is just like crazy sci-fi stuff. Well, that, that's the thing, right? And I, I actually put some elements from the animated series in the comic. Uh, and that was received either really favorably or really not favorably, depending <laughs> on who you ask. Uh, and, and for me, like, G.I. Joe has always had a sci-fi element. And I've right. seen recently... Like, not to hold forth on this topic too long, but like, you know, there's the new G.I. Joe six inch figures, which are amazing. I'm in, I'm in absolute love with them. But there have been people who are pretty salty about the fact that they have energy weapons and not, you know, guns. Right. And like, I, I get it. Well, I think we all get it. We don't have to get into that. But like, if you had been watching this and G.I. Joe had come out as it did, no changes, but they had laser guns instead of machine guns, would you have cared? Would it have changed anything for you back then? I think for, for me, it, it wouldn't have made that much of a difference if that's how it had started. But I always liked it um, when the sci-fi element of stuff kind of stayed to the Cobra side yep. and Joe was dealing with more real world tech. Yeah, that's a good point. I agree, uh, because I do agree, became, I'm just posing the question. Sure. Um, and uh, I have that snake eyes sitting out in my garage uh, de decontaminating. I haven't opened it yet. Um, <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Corona. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah. Sad, realistic statements. So, so I yeah. do really like... Sorry to bring it home for a second. Oh, <laughs> no, it's, it's all fine. good. 
the uh, I do really like the realism of the weapons, especially when coupled with Larry Hama's realistic writing in the comic. Right. So you got yes. a feeling that the GI Joe Force was more grounded in reality, and I could forgive Cobra being much more sci-fi. They had Destro, this enemy weapon supplier that was cooking up this crazy, you know, near future kind of technology. And I love that Cobra had that and that their vehicles were more stylistically a departure from reality. Whereas the early GI Joe vehicles were basically just real vehicles. I mean, you look yeah, at their, yeah. their tanks and motorcycles. There was nothing too exploratory there early on for GI Joe. Mm -hmm. The His tank remains one of my all time favorite designs. It, yeah. it really I was just, just gonna say that. Yeah. Wait, wait. I, was yeah. I love a his tank. Love now, a his tank. Now we have Scarlet and Snake Eyes laying on the ground together. We got a moment of them, you know, a, a little a little hint that there was a relationship yeah. of some sort. Sorry, just thought I'd point that out real quick. No, ha and having been married to a redhead, I feel like I should warn him. But it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I'm currently married to a redhead. Oh, you'll be missed. You'll be missed. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, Tom, uh, right? Another thing. Okay. And that, no, another thing I want to point out is um, it's really great to see the original lineup because as somebody who was in from the start, the one yeah. thing where the shows, and I understand why because they're selling toys, and even with the comics to some degree, um, once the new lines came out, the old Joes just got shelved. And right. we never really got those great stories with, you know, Breaker and Flash and you know rock and roll like i don't remember rock and roll ever having more than like five lines and he was one of my favorite jokes yeah uh, i don't want to get carson too excited because i know this is a hot subject for him worlds without end gave steeler more love than he's ever been given in, in... <laughs> oh there he is there's yeah. steeler what's up yep. yeah Steeler? you can tell by the visor uh yeah. but yeah we'll, we'll maybe we'll last long enough to get to that but uh yeah i totally just... agree did you nope. catch the uh, the female soldier in green there a second ago? Ah, oh, I missed it. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, that's, you know, that's one thing I loved about Joe as well is like, and you didn't even notice it when you were a kid, uh, but you understood like the GI Joe team, everybody looked different, not just in what they were wearing, but you had, you know, there. I wish there had been more female characters in hindsight, but like the Joe team itself, uh, it they were made up of people from all over. The, the ethnic map yeah and that was that was that was larry but that's that's just larry you know yeah right. yeah yeah uh i i will say and i i'd love to know what it was like for you guys uh i and i'm not trying to stake my claim on early feminism but like when i was a kid i loved princess leia in star wars yep. so I was never I was never turned off by female characters in the things that i loved i i grabbed a scarlet figure as soon as i could find one and I, I didn't ever have any hesitation. Did you? I mean, you were no, kids. Nope. Nobody's going to judge I think, you. Um, I think it was more just the people making the decisions of saying, like, oh, boys don't want to buy a female figure. But if they were on the show, I would have bought it. Like, Lady J was yes. one of my favorites because exactly. she had so much yeah. screen time on the show. Uh, so Lady J and Baroness as figures, I liked them just as much as my any of the guy figures because they were on the show. They were just part of the story. So well, like, and, I think more you, you upper could, level people in the toy industry making those decisions. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, they, I, did, they did have some sales history to base it on. So uh, I'll give you guys the quick toy rundown, right? You had Scarlet 82, CoverGirl 83, Baroness 84, Lady J 85, Zorana 86, Jinx 87. You got one woman per year. And then Ron yep. Rudak got off the line and women disappeared. Yes, wow. yeah, that's right. So until Scarlet version two in like 1993. And I, I think Ron would fight for those concepts and was able to get one in. But yeah. I think that yeah. they always had that Scarlet letter that these won't sell. Because if you remember G.I. Joe, the 12 inch toys, one of the most valuable figures now is the nurse because it was pulled because it sold so poorly. They put it out on shelves, it didn't sell, they pulled it. And so some of those decisions were informed by previous uh, purchasing habits. I, I, you know, I loved having Jinx and Lady J and Baroness and all of them, but yeah, I think there is some purchasing history there to blame. Well, I think the main I, difference is though that with GI Joe there was a story. With uh, I'm sorry, right. with GI Joe Real American Hero there was a story. So Scarlet and and Cover Girl, you know, not quite as much as, as Scarlet, but Scarlet had a purpose for being where she was. She made herself a valued part of the team, and I think. 
as kids, we watched that and we saw, um, you know, hey, so Duke and Snake Eyes and Stalker and, and all these other characters, they're responding to what Scarlet is saying. So clearly they respect her. So she must, there's there's value in her yes, being there. Right. The same way yes. that when Princess Leia grabs the gun and says, get this walking carpet out of my way, <laughs> you know, and Han and, and Luke, the guys who we had been following their lead the whole time, when they got out of the way and she she led them into the fight, you know, as kids, we understood, oh, you know, she's just as much of a badass, and we didn't right. even know that word then, but she's just <laughs> as much of a badass as they are. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, they us, taught, us, they taught just, us to appreciate them. She was intelligent, yes. and she could fight to a standstill with any man on the team. So she was smart, and she could whoop ass. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and the G.I. Joe nurse, they didn't have the benefit of a story. Right. For sure. You know? For sure. And I know yeah. there was a G.I. Joe comic that DC did periodically. But, uh, it just wasn't the same kind of thing. Yep. Well, so so, towards the end of that, uh, that part of the series, like, um, I've, I've kind of watched through a lot of these with our Star Joe's podcast. Uh, that's, that's hosted by uh, Ryan Drost and uh, uh, Chuck Averett. They... Um, we started going back and rewatching a lot of these and kind of doing, we, we weren't like doing it live. We were doing a commentary like this at all. We were just kind of reviewing the episode. Yeah. And it was really funny. We started counting up like how many times Duke gets captured. And it's like, <laughs> it's, it's a ridiculous amount of times. <laughs> so this kind of, that, that's that, his special that skill. Off. Exactly. It's like infiltration yeah. by accident. <laughs> I have to say they, they, they had that one shot of the uh, snake robots or battle Ooh, armors, yeah. whatever they were depending on how you wanted to use them. I love that toy. God, yep. that was such a cool toy. Uh, I, I'd love to have another one, but uh, man, they were just, I remember having that thing and it was one of those toys that if I had one, I really needed six of them to, to really, you know, <laughs> yeah. do what you needed to do for your fight. Well, like with that, the end, also the end, it was kind of previewing the next episode. I, I, I couldn't help but chuckle where Duke like, uh, just ramps that his tank off of a rock like it's a Dukes of Hazard car, and I'm like, I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> He's like, Whoa. now that Duke boy was in a whole mess of trouble. <laughs> it just like pauses. We were like, what are they gonna do now? Anyway, yeah. Uh, uh, that, so that went, uh, that went laser fast. rifle to your head. Laser rifle to your head. <laughs> you have just been exposed to GI Joe. You're whatever age you were when this happened. Who is your favorite Joe? And who is your favorite Cobra? Um, well, for me, uh, off of off of the, this mini series, I think it changed as the, the 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 cartoon went on because it was like uh, Flint and Lady J were uh, two of my favorites. And but then I realized after the fact that the two two characters that had the most speaking lines in the cartoon was Lady J and Shipwreck of all the characters throughout the whole series. They had the most. Sure anybody else so i'm not surprised wow. that lady j plus i thought she was hot so like that was Dude. that was uh her voice is so amazing oh my god you, you met her in indianapolis didn't you uh flint, yeah, yeah flint and yeah. lady j were there in indianapolis yeah, and the two of them together oh no, nice. uh hearing nice. their voices together and them like yeah. bantering off of each other was amazing yeah that was cool uh, uh so for those who the show me. well um so uh, i'm sorry i i did i apologize for interrupting uh, so I was going to say that Brandon and I have kind of a different experience in that we came to the show after the comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, the comics yeah. had been out for 15 months before the show started. Right. And uh, I, when long? I started, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, cause it came out in uh, September of 83. Do I have that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, and the, and the comic launched in 82. Two, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. I got your research ready. Uh, this original oh, yeah, date this guy. was uh, September twelfth, nineteen eighty three. Okay, yeah. So, um, so I had been into the comic for a while, and so my favorites were based on the comics, not so much the mm-hmm. animated series. Yep. So when I watched the animated series, there was some shifting of this guy versus that guy, and and, and who was my favorite toy to play with. Uh, Because originally it was built around the storyline of the comics. And so, like, I I loved Roadblock, uh, Stalker. uh, A big character for me was always rock and roll. Uh, 
And, it, I, and I can trace it back to, I had that oversized G.I. Joe treasury. And the backup story was Snake Eyes and Rock and Roll. It was called Hot, Hot Potato. Potato. Hot Potato. Yeah. <laughs> and so for me, for me, uh, Rock and Roll was like instantly one of my favorite characters. And actually when I started collecting the end, Rock and Roll was one of the first characters I picked up. So, cool. um, so when he wasn't on the show very much, super disappointed. And then, you yep. know, Roadblock was always kind of a comic relief. <laughs> and in the, in the in the comics, he was kind of more of a scary, intense yeah. kind of not scary, but uh, imposing kind of fella. And that was the guy that I liked, and and I liked that Duke was kind of a dick in the comic. <laughs> you know, you weren't really oh, yeah. sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and so um, so there was a shifting of how I felt about different characters based on the show. Right. And it altered the way I played because originally the way I would play was based more on the comics and who the oh, team, who the interior uh, teams and the, and the interior dynamics of Larry's story were so drastically different to the show. Right. Brandon, well, did you have the same experience? Well, I was going to say, well, then, so take that. And then once you started watching the show, though, who were some standout characters that you loved strictly just because being immersed <clears throat> in the show? Oh, well, uh, at, well, after the show, um, I would have to say it was probably more like Spirit. Um, Wait, like right. after oh, yeah, the yeah. show? Interesting. Yeah, okay. after the yeah. show. Uh, there, I just, yeah. he, because the toy never did much for me. What? Uh, but then, Sacrilege. <laughs> no, but then, but then he had an eagle like, and an arrow rifle. Right. What more do you want? <laughs> You know, yeah, like but, people but, do. Plus, plus the but, innovation of the rubbery hair, like the, the little ponytail thing. It was an amazing yeah, toy. Yeah, he had the best hair. Really uh, I, I don't know. But when you he compare him hair. to, <laughs> when you compare him to like, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling for a name here, but like, you know, this guy looks so much cooler than <laughs> this guy. Oh, you know? I beg to differ. Oh, come on. That, that I'd like to apologize for Tom gun? Feaster, everyone. I'm sorry. <laughs> Look, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Um, so yeah. I will say this about Spirit, though. It was Not really, so much. It was really interesting that Spirit became the foil for Storm Shadow in the cartoon, which to me, yeah, that yeah. felt really, really wrong. Like, Storm Shadow's yeah. just going to kick his ass. Like, Spirit yeah. can hunt him down. Yeah. He'll be able to track him down right. after he recovers from the whipping. But there's no way in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. I and never... I felt that, like, as a six-year-old, as a seven-year-old watching this, I was like, no, Spirit wouldn't win that fight. Yeah, yeah well, I see, never one of my frustrations that weird with the partnership. As a kid, one of my frustrations with the show was I wanted more Snake Eyes. Because yeah, if yeah. you read the comic, mm -hmm. yeah. it was basically the Snake Eyes story, and yeah. everybody else kind of showed up on occasion. <laughs> and so in the show, and I understand there's no dialogue, so it makes it harder to tell a Snake Eyes story. But uh, I just I wanted more Snake Eyes from the animated series. Yeah, I yeah. agree. That's, that's one of the. As a, if you as an artist ever tells me how hard it is to write a Snake Eyes story without dialogue, I'll break quarantine. <laughs> uh, I'll come and find you, Tom. Uh, <laughs> I I know. Let me that tell you, there's nothing. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than being told you're going to write a Snake Eyes story and you get get to write dialogue for him. I don't want to write dialogue for him. Snake Eyes, <laughs> no, he doesn't seriously. talk. Yeah. No, it was... Did, was did uh, you really got that note? Oh, he wow. talks for the first three issues. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Thanks for reading it, right. Tom. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's all like... Two of us worked on origins. it. We're right here, Tom. <laughs> yeah. No, it was I'm, I'm, I, it was I'm interesting not, drawing him because I'm not what you call a reader. <laughs> <laughs> we know. I like to draw. We, we got like that pictures. impression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, we could probably wrap it up. I think tonight we're going to be doing this again uh, yep. this week. So uh, each night this week, same time. Um, uh, hopefully, everybody can uh, join us and uh, spread the word that we're doing this. It'd be awesome to kind of get more people on board and uh, in the comments, just to kind of the camaraderie of it. That's kind of the whole point.
We got uh we got thirty viewers right now, so Whoa! Think, wow, people tuned That's in. Great. So uh and and the comments you you guys can go in and look at them. They've been nothing but positive. Um, you know, some Thanks, funny internet funny feedback on the commentary and everything. Uh so yeah, Good. definitely go through and check out the comments. But uh and, so we'll, and, we'll try and to by get the way, up. let us know what you would like to have more of or sure, less yeah. of. It's right. probably Tom uh <laughs> for the less of, but it's fine. It's fine. I'd like Robert to speak more. Uh and I suspect <laughs> Robert would like that too. So we'll be back here tomorrow night around 8.30. Hopefully Tom will still be with us. <laughs> I, I want to say one thing. Thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in. Thank you for watching this. Thank you guys for taking part. Uh, again, this whole thing was meant as just a fun and loving distraction. And uh, I, I couldn't be happier that this is actually happening. Um, so thank you all. I, I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you for having me, guys. Appreciate it. We couldn't All right. do it without you. I mean, we literally couldn't do it without you. That's what Fobbits yeah. are for. All yeah, right, so exactly. 8.30 tomorrow night, Tuesday. We'll try to kick off. Uh, for everybody that's watching, it might be a few minutes later than that because Fobbits got to do Fobbit work. But uh, right. we'll see you guys around 8.30 tomorrow. All right. Yo, Thank Joe. You. Yo, Joe. Yo, Joe. He never gives up. He's always there. Fighting for freedom over land and air. G.I. Joe. Joe. G.I. Joe is there.